Good afternoon, arts education advocates. Good morning to arts edu education advocates on the West Coast. My name is Tushar Swain. I am Director of Public Policy at Americans for the Arts. We're so honored that you're joining us today uh, for this Arts and Education Week preparation webinar. Uh, in 2010, the U.S. House of Representatives passed a resolution which designated the week starting with the second Sunday in September as, as National Arts and Education Week. The purpose of the resolution is to celebrate the transformative power of arts education in all students. The resolution also encourages governors, mayors, and other elected officials, such as state legislatures and school boards, to sign similar proclamations. So today we hope to equip you with those tools to advocate for those resolutions to state and local lawmakers. Uh, we hope we will hear from experts on their arts education experiences, and we will provide you with some of the newest and most relevant data and research on, the, on arts and arts education. Next slide. Americans for the Arts and Arts Action Fund host year-round advocacy training. This is our third uh, in our series this year, thus Advocacy 301. Arts Vote 2024 will make your vote count webinar on September 5th, 2024 will be our Advocacy 401. This webinar will focus uh, on how to best use your state voter fact sheets and you'll hear from state arts leaders about how they are galvanizing get out the vote efforts in their states. And we'll have a bonus post-election impact webinar uh, on 2024 as we'll analyze how the election results impact um, the arts and arts policies. And I think you'll want to tune into that. Next slide. Today's webinar resources, including these slides on your screen, will be hosted on our webinar resources panel with the link provided in the chat and on the slide. You'll be receiving new updates on various new assets that we have to advocate for Arts and Education Week. And if you have any questions and at any time, you can email us at advocacy at artsusa.org and we'll get back to you with an answer as soon as we possibly can. Next slide. You can ask questions today in the Q&A box where you can also upvote a question to better ensure that that question is asked. And we might not get to every single question today. If that's the case, an Americans for the Arts staff member will follow up with you in the coming days to answer those questions. So thank you in advance for your patience. Next slide. And here are, our, here are our wonderful participants in today's webinar. Dr. Susan Magzaman will provide our keynote presentation, followed by a panel featuring three expert state and local advocates, Jeff Robinson of South Carolina Arts Alliance, Lauren Meehan of Arts Ed New Newark, <clears throat> and Waduta Muhammad of Georgians for the Arts. And our resident expert on arts education advocacy, Olivia Farpley, will take us home with some advocacy tips and tools at your disposal for Arts and Education Week. Before we turn it over to that star-studded lineup, I'd like to bring in our interim co-CEO, Jamie Bennett, to kick us off with a few words. Hi, Jamie. Hey, Tushar, thanks so much. And I am really just here um, on behalf of myself and Susie DeValle, who's apt as other co-CEO, uh, to thank you all so much for, for taking the time this afternoon to think about arts education and to think about some of the ways that we can be active citizens and help make sure the federal government is responding to what those of us on the ground actually want. Um, Waduta, Jeff, Lauren, and Susan are four absolutely extraordinary colleagues who have a lot to share with all of you. And I'm just really excited to get into what they're doing. Um, my own history with arts education professionally goes back. Um, I was lucky enough to work with a woman called Agnes Gund, who started working on issues of arts education in New York City in the 1970s, when New York City was on the, on the verge of bankruptcy. And as many of you know, the decision that the city made at that time was to eliminate arts as a category from New York City's public schools. And it feels like we've still been fighting that battle for 50 years, and it's possible to sort of lose sight of the advances that have been made 
made and that things are actually different. So really excited to be sort of focused on what Tushar teed up for us, the legislative action that we want to be advocating on behalf of and how we want to move things forward. Um, I'll say that my actual connection to arts education goes back to when I was a singing orphan in a production of Oliver at the age of seven. Um, so just really excited to be here. Don't want to take any more time in between you and getting to hear from Waduda and Jeff and Lauren and Susan. So with that, again, just thank you all for making the time this afternoon. And I promise you the next hour is going to be really special. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jamie, and thank you for your uh, uh, dedicated and continued commitment to arts education. We appreciate having you. I'm truly thankful to have gotten to know our keynote presenter over the past year. Dr. Susan Magzaman is the founder and executive director of the International Arts and Mind Lab, a pioneering initiative from the Peterson Brain Science Institute at Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. Her body of work lies at the intersection of brain sciences and the arts and how our unique response to aesthetic experiences can amplify human potential. Dr. McZamon is, a, is an award-winning author having published eight books and her newest book, Your Brain on Art, How the Arts Transform Us is a New York Times bestseller written alongside with Ivy Ross, Vice President of Google Hardware. Susan, we are thrilled to have you and the floor is yours. Well, it's really a pleasure to be here. Hi, everyone. Um, you know, I when Tushar asked me to do this talk, I was uh, really honored. Um, learning and the arts have really been a through line for me throughout my life. And so um, I'm just very excited. In many ways, this conversation is, is like coming home for me. So um, I have too many slides and not enough time. So let's get started. Um, next slide. So um, as Tushar mentioned, um, in 2007, um, I was asked to develop a program at Johns Hopkins to look at the impact of the arts for health, well-being, and learning. We had a donor who believed that the arts could save us, and I really believed that from my own experience. And so we went to work really starting to think deeply about how many different types of uh, fields study the arts and how we could bring that together. So our lab now is called the Center for Applied Neuroaesthetics, and we work in four areas, research, field building, leadership, education, and training. Next slide. And around 2017, I started to hear from people all over the world saying that they were using the arts in some form for well-being and learning and health and uh, was asked to start to think more deeply about this uh, at the university level. So I connected with the Aspen Institute where for two years we put our heads to the ground and really listened carefully to what people were saying all over the world and started to hear these themes about the need for coming together to bring all of the different art forms in ways that we use the arts to help humanity. And so our North Star is to ensure that they use the arts in many forms as part of mainstream education, medicine, and public health. And the Neural Arts Blueprint was really, was really birthed around 2022. Um, and just to give a little bit more information on that, next slide. Uh, the Blueprint is really a global network of individuals and, and, a, and, and a coalitions that are looking to create very strong action plans that, that improve health, well-being, and learning and also unite diverse fields. You know, we're so siloed that it's very difficult sometimes to know what's happening in this field because there's so many things happening with different sectors, systems, and also to really be able to build this idea of, of a new field. Next slide. So um, at the end of 2022, we released the Neuro Arts Blueprint, which is in essence is a five-year plan that includes five core recommendations. The first is to strengthen the research foundation of neuro arts in all of the different ways that we study the arts. The second is to honor and support the many arts practices that promote health and well-being and learning. The third is to expand and enrich educational and career pathways. Um, the fourth is to develop advocate and advocacy for sustainable funding and to promote effective policy. And last, to build capacity, leadership, and communication strategies. The next slide. 
So we've done a lot in the last several years. Um, we are now full speed ahead in the implementation strategy, and that is including the launch of a global resource center that will launch early next year. And I call it a virtual watering hole where anyone interested in the arts from researchers, practitioners, funders, policymakers, advocates, educators can come to one place and find something that they're looking for. We've also created something called the Community Neuro Arts Coalitions, and these are hyper-local coalitions uh, that will be, um, uh, be able to come together in a learning community on the Resource Center. We now have three pilots, and at, in October, we'll be, we'll be launching a much larger initiative where we're expecting between 300 and 500 communities to join this effort. And we also announced this year the first ever Neuro Arts Investigator Award with Renee Fleming. And we funded seven interdisciplinary teams who are working at different types of intersections with, with different art forms for different kinds of issues. Next, next slide. We've also commissioned two economic impact studies, uh, one on Alzheimer's and music um, uh, in terms of quality of life and a second on what's called the true value. And that release that will be coming out with AARP in the next several months. And we've created a stellar scientific advisory board that's really looking at the research agenda for studying the arts and learning and health and well-being. And then through the generous gift of the Music Man Foundation, we are launching something called the Academic Education Network, which is a global uh, network that's looking at research training programs and also practices that are being used within the academic community, whether that's four-year universities, community colleges, informal learning. So we start to really be able to build the evidence, the practice, and also hopefully the policies around making this really a sustainable field. Next slide. But there's lots more to do. And these are just some of the things that we'll be working on, including uh, a global summit, uh, strengthening the policy, policy and funding, uh, looking at developing a multifaceted communication strategy and many other things. Next slide. But this is not happening um, alone. There are many organizations in the US and around the world that we're working with, including Americans for the Arts, AARP, the World Health Organization, National Endowment for the Arts, NIH, Health and Human Services, the Kennedy Center, many performing arts and, and cultural arts organizations, both large and small, all over the country and, and all over the world. And I think what's important to say here is that this idea of neuro arts, of the arts in service of humanity, is not a nice to have. It's not an unrealistic idea or a pipe dream. It really is a rigorous research-driven translational field. And I think we already know that there are billions of people around the world already using the arts to enhance their health, their well-being, coalescing with an eye on sustainability. Next slide. So um, Tuchar mentioned uh, your brain on art. And this was written with my co-author, Ivy Ross. It took us over four years to write this book. We actually interviewed over a hundred Mary lived experiences. And in just six days, the book became a New York Times bestseller. And our publisher told us that it's extremely rare for a book about the arts to have that kind of a trajectory. But what we've heard from thousands of people now is that the book validated what people already knew about the, the art and arts experiences, and that it also gave people words to describe the intuitive feelings that they had, and in many ways gave them permission to be able to do art either again or for the first time. And so I think this field and the book has really shown me that you know, we are hungry for better solutions to support our, our lives, the lives of our children and our communities, and that this work is building meaning and purpose, and I, and I think hope. And so it's a very exciting time. Next slide. So the book makes a bold claim that we're standing on the verge of a cultural shift in which the arts and play can deliver potent, accessible, proven health and well-being solutions to, to billions of people. Next slide. And I want to just talk a little bit about what I mean when I talk about art. Um, and really, the definition is quite 
broad, but I think important. And that is that when I think about the arts and aesthetic experiences, I think about creative expression. And in that way, it's really unlimited. Um, we could be talking about theater, dance, singing, visual arts, but also gardening, cooking, architecture, and, and so much more. And I think we know that um, this work is really beginning to uh, solidify and all of these art forms are moving us to uh, a very clear understanding that we're really wired for creative expression and that they are the conduit for critical child development. Next slide. So this really made me think more deeply about the role the arts once played in our lives. And in writing the book, we had an opportunity to talk to indigenous cultures all over the world. And in fact, there's still 5,000 active tribes and many of them do not have a word for art because it's how they live in their lives. This is an image of a Colombian cave painting that just represents um, ancient experiences of daily life. Next slide. This is an this image that you're about to see is a, is a picture that was done in a couple months ago in a summer camp where a 10 year old boy was actually drawing what was on his mind. And I, if you look closely, you can see there are fire breathing dragons um, and, and a lot of stuff is going on. And the reality is that not much has changed. We're still documenting through our visual arts and the way that we create art, what's happening in our world today. Next slide. And this is a story cloth that illustrates life's joys, struggles, and triumphs through a program called the Common Threads Project, which also you know, shows so many different aspects of our life, including, if you see in the bottom left-hand corner, a home where we seek shelter and comfort, whether there's something that's happening in the world that is unsafe, um, or we're just looking for for rest. So, you know, these these experiences continue to be illustrated in such beautiful ways. Now, next slide. So, another example is this piece of art that was found by geologist David Zhang in Tibet, and it's believed to be two hundred and twenty six thousand years old. And if you look at it closely, what you can see are representations of our hands. And I, I find it fascinating that these are still the same tools that we create our world today. You know, we're both makers and beholders since the beginning of the time. And, you know, when we were working on the book, uh, I had an opportunity to meet with the Harvard evolutionary biologist, E.O. Wilson. And he made a great point that um, these experiences are really gateways to transformation and transcendence, and that they're essential to the human species. And that we would not have evolved had we not really needed to create these expressions and share ourselves in, in the ways in the ways that we do. But the only way that we can uh, share our voice and experience the world is by bringing the world in through our senses. Next slide. And um, I won't go into a lot of details in the interest of time, but I've become really fascinated by our sensory mechanisms and the extraordinary ways that our bodies work to bring the world into our our, our inner lives. Uh, you know, visually you process about 34,000 pieces of information in a single hour. You'll process 30 million pieces of information, visual information um, over your lifetime. Your fingertips have 3,000, each of your fingertips have 3,000 touch receptors that allow you to instantly release neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine and oxytocin. And even your nose, you have, you can detect over 1 trillion odors with over 400 different types of scent receptors. And those scent receptors turn over every 30 to 60 days. So bodies are these incredible uh, have this incredible capacity. And we also, because of the way we come into the world and our genetics and how we live, um, each of us has a different sensory profile. So my hearing might be better than my eyesight. Um, I, I may not have as strong a sense of smell as maybe touch, but we each have this unique, almost sensory uh, impression that allows us to be in the world in different ways. Uh, next slide. But I think interestingly, most of us think of ourselves as thinking creatures that, uh, sorry, most of us think of ourselves as thinking creatures that feel when we're actually feeling creatures that think. And this is a quote from Jill Bolte-Taylor, who's a neuroanatomist. 
And, you know, as we're beginning to understand more and more about how we feel, we now know that we have over 34,000 different feelings. And so to be able to process those feelings and make sense of those requires extraordinary mechanisms. Next slide. And so, you know, the, so the takeaway here is that we are wired for the arts. And we now know that as we are bringing in these artistic and aesthetic experiences, they're all altering a complex physiological network of interconnected systems. So cardiovascular systems, muscular systems, respiratory systems, immune and endocrine systems. But in many cases, they're happening simultaneously. And I really can't think of anything else that does that with our brains, bodies, and spirits in the same way. Uh, next slide. And so while philosophers and artists and children, I think, have always known the power of the arts, it's only been in the last 25 years that we've been able to get inside our heads to really understand how the arts and aesthetic experiences change us. And so this field called neuroaesthetics is the study of how the arts and aesthetic experiences measurably change our brains, bodies, and behavior, and how this knowledge, and this is really important, how this knowledge can be translated into practices that advance our health, our well-being, our learning, community development, thriving, all these things that make us so human. And so this field of neuroaesthetics um, from a scientific perspective, brings together brain science, technology, arts, psychology, social work, uh, public health, many disciplines that create both an interdisciplinary and a transdisciplinary approach to really understanding not only how and why mechanisms work, function and structure happen and behavior occurs, but also how we can use this in the world in a very significant way. Next slide. And so I mentioned that uh, the way that we bring this information into our bodies is through our senses, but our bodies have these enormous capacities to be able to process information. And that's really through this, uh, this process called neuroplasticity. And you know, neuroplasticity really underlies everything that we do, our movements, emotions, our memories. Uh, when we're bringing information into our brains and bodies, um, we have over a hundred billion neurons that connect at a synaptic level. And this is how we are able to create strong neural pathways that connect different systems and structures within our brains and bodies. And we now know that the arts and aesthetic experiences are some of the most powerful ways that we're really able to create really strong neural connections from the time that we're very little all the way through our lifespan. So the power of neuroplasticity is that um, it happens throughout our life and we always have the ability to be able to change our brains and bodies. And I, I find that to be incredibly hopeful. Next slide. So this is just a, a image from the book and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it other than to show you that you can see all of these different sensory systems that connect and sort of at the middle of the brain, um, which is where the hippocampus is and um, the, the what's called the saliency network. Um, and that's kind of represented in the blue area and sort of the orange area. Um, what we know is that we could never process all of the information that we bring in that's around us and that we bring into our bodies. But our, we have this amazing ability to be able to process what's either important to us for practical reasons or emotional reasons. And that's what's called salient. So, you know, in, 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 in truth, we only process about five, we are only conscious of about 5% of our mental activity. Everything else really happens on an unconscious level. Uh, next slide. And so the default mode network is this part of our brain that is sometimes called the neurological basis of self. And it's this part of your brain that goes to work when you're not processing information, when you're in that sort of place between the notes where you're really sort of um, allowing what you've brought in to really um, become better known to you. Um, it's this place where you connect the dots, where you find patterns, where you make sense of the world. It's this place where you decide what you like and you don't like, what's beautiful and not beautiful. Um, and it's also um, this place where you daydream and mind wander and you think to yourself. And so the default mode network turns out to be a really important place where we all need to go. So it's a real call out for taking the time to be able to just let yourself process information. Next slide. 
And so just to take that one step further, and I alluded to this a little earlier, um, neuroscientist Anjan Chatterjee has developed a theoretical model called the aesthetic triad that you're seeing here, which helps to explain why each of us understand information sort of on an individual level. And so there are three components that collectively come together to create your unique experiences. And, and that's really what you're seeing here. So it's a combination of both what where you come from and what you know, how you're sensorially or motorly wired, and then how you value those kinds of experiences. And it's at the center of that that really creates your unique aesthetic experiences. Next slide. So I, I love this metaphor of the elephant in the room, and it's mostly because the arts are ancient and powerful like elephants. They're also an evolutionary imperative for humanity. Um, they're really fundamental and they're so uniquely important. And depending upon where you touch the elephant, you're gonna get something different. And I think that's also really important when you're thinking about what art forms for what purposes at different ages um, throughout, throughout our lives. Next slide. So this is just to say that neuro arts has implications for every sector of society. And we're seeing that now emerge as the research is coming forward. Next slide. I'm not gonna read these, um, but you'll get this deck. And what I wanted to provide to you was some of the significant impact that we're starting to see through the research. So um, you can see that uh, just working on an art project 45 minutes can reduce stress by 25% or dancing for just 15 minutes reduces stress, anxiety, depression, and also helps to release different kinds of hormones like endorphins and serotonin. And there's a lot of this kind of information that's really coming forward that I think helps to make the case for why the arts in education, in learning, in and out of school time, and in all the other areas where we're starting to, to know that the arts are really making a huge difference. Next slide. Um, this is just to say that um, we now know that uh, research, researchers are discovering that the arts, like no other kind of learning, transfers in every area of our lives, and that we know more than ever that this, this idea that creativity and creating art, where many of us were shut down at such a young age for making art, really, in essence, um, begins to start to um, uh, 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 create the kind of uh, resistance to building strong neuroplasticity that we were talking about earlier. Next slide. Um, in brain development, you know, we, we're seeing the music, which is the most studied art form, really have a huge impact on the way that we um, create these strong neural pathways. But also, we now know that things like singing and humming activate the vagus nerve and engage the parasympathetic nervous system and help us become instantly calm and able to focus. So the more we start to think about how do these different art forms affect different aspects of uh, our lives, the more we're able to begin to start to um, advance that. Next slide. Um, I just wanna say briefly that um, technology and interactive experiences are starting to merge and dissolve the boundaries between art and viewers and engaging our senses and creating very strong uh, emotional reactions. And more and more, we're starting to see how arts and immersive experiences have a really huge ability to be able to help us build some of the skills that we need. And, and I think we're seeing that a little bit in education, but um, but I think there's a balance and a big conversation to be had there. Uh, next slide. And just lifting up that while I spoke to about music earlier, um, you know, music reduces anxiety. We now know by up to 44%, pain by 29%. And also this, has huge implications on the kinds of uh, pharmacological interventions and, and what's happening in that space. And so beginning to start to think about other implications for how these art forms are impacting us is also super important. Next slide. Um, a shout out to working with folks with developmental differences. And this is a program in Venezuela where they host these amazing interactive studios with visual art and are starting to see things like, like problem solving, focus, attention, uh, self-confidence build in, in huge measure. Next slide. And just a, a, one other art form that I wanted to sort of lift up is the idea of expressive writing and also um, poetry. Uh, social psychologist James Pennebaker has been studying this for over 30 years. 
And what he's seen is that cognitive load increases and cortisol decreases when we are writing and sharing our stories and expressing what's happening with us. And I think there's something really valuable about this act of writing and telling our stories. And we're seeing that even if you never share your story to be able to articulate those feelings that have been held inside of you really starts to affect things like PTSD and trauma. Next slide. So in closing, I just wanted to leave you with these five takeaways uh, that can be used in many of the domains that you work in. Um, the first is we have the proof that there is an art for that. Anytime, anywhere, anybody, that arts, science, and technology are emerging and they're emerging at incredibly rapid paces. And finally, when you change your lens, you change your life. Next slide. So, Art is our one true global language. It speaks to our need to reveal, heal, and transform. It transcends our ordinary lives and lets us imagine what is possible. The success of our species, I think, comes down to this. Art creates culture, culture creates humanity, and community creates life. So I just wanna say thank you, and I'm looking forward to, to having a larger conversation. Thank you, Susan. Just a wonderful presentation, and you you do fantastic. You, you do such fantastic work. I we have time for one, maybe two questions, and I want to just just get straight to them. Um, uh, this is a great question. How has the research uh, been received by those who challenge uh, uh, the value of arts? Have opinions been changed? Um, I think that this is to a broader issue of challenges uh, as it pertains to arts funding, uh, maybe at the state and local levels, as well as arts education funding. So could you speak to that? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. So, you know, I, Jamie alluded to this, that, um, you know, arts have been taken out of schools in the past. They're still being taken out of schools. Um, they are still in many in many uh, counties and states and at a federal level may be seen as, as something that can go, that it's a nice to have. And I think the science of the arts is really creating a new message. And that's really important that we're starting to be able to show the neurophysiology, the psychology, the structure and function. And that argument is a really important argument. So, uh, I have seen this be a nonpartisan issue, which is incredibly important across these different domains. I've also seen that uh, when you really start to understand what individual policymakers um, are addressing in their own lives and you bring this work forward, it is invariable that you'll hit on something that someone can relate to through a lens of the arts. Oftentimes, I'll ask people if they've ever had an art experience that's changed their life in some way. And without a, to a person, it is. So, you know, we're working right now um, on the messaging and to make sure that we understand what the value proposition is in different sectors for different policymakers so that we can align to that. And, and I'll just use an example, um, you know, in the 90s and early 2000s, when uh, early childhood was really um, on the table in a, in a big way, we started to show the value of birth to five for brain development um, for early childhood education, that's when the that's when the narrative really started to change. Now we are beginning in, in large part with Americans for the Arts to start to identify advocates at the state and national level that are interested in being um, supporters of this work. Uh, but we're really working hard to be able to develop both economic cases. So this Alzheimer's work that I mentioned is really important, but also scientific cases. So we're trying to really package this information in a way that can move the ball forward and not just um, turn up the dial, but really flip the switch. Great. Thank you, Susan. I'll have to leave it there. But uh, thank you so much for your uh, work. It is uh, truly inspirational uh, and invaluable. We have some questions. We're going to forward those over to uh, you as well, and uh, we will get answers to all of your questions. But thank you, Susan. You're uh, great at what you do. Uh, more importantly, you're a wonderful person. Thank you for joining us today. It's really a pleasure. Thank you. Great. So we're going to shift now to our uh, 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 to our panel. 
uh, will be focusing on a panel on arts education advocacy. Uh, joining me are three experts who have been state and local arts advocates, administrators, and artists themselves. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce Jeff Robinson, Executive Director at South Carolina Arts Alliance, Lauren Meehan, Director at Arts Ed Network, and, or Newark, I'm sorry, and Waduda Muhammad, Executive Director at Georgians uh, for the Arts. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. I think my first question uh, for all of you is, is just to give a little bit, um, uh, to give us a little bit of background on yourself, the work that you do, and why arts education advocacy is important to you. I will start um, just on my screen here. I see Waduda is to my right, so I'll start with you. Hi, hi, hello, everyone. Um, good afternoon. My name is Waduda Mohammed, um, Executive Director of Georgians for the Arts. I have. Um, always been a lifelong learner of the arts. I'm a first generation immigrant. I came to America with my family at the age of eight and had a really hard time assimilating to American culture and the arts was the way and the language that I used to be able to navigate uh, just through, you know, through everything. So I, I, I consider myself a lifelong learner of the arts. I've studied everything from dance to instrument, to drawing and painting, to photography, to sculpture, you name it. And went on to college to start study arts education. And uh, that was during the time that arts education was being cut in um, public schools. So I shifted to art history um, and got involved in arts advocacy at the state level in uh, 2008. So have served at the uh, state arts advocacy level for a little over, I keep saying 10 years. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, just uh, happy to be here. Well, thank you for all of that great work. Jeff, how about you? Yeah, hi everybody. Jeff Robinson with the South Carolina Arts Alliance. Um, I spent seven years as a middle school band director. So if I uh, if I wasn't doing this, I'd still be out there uh, ringing the bell for arts education. And uh, if you're on this call and you're uh, and you're currently a teacher, thank you for everything you do. Um, I, I I understand, and I, I've I've been in your shoes, and um and you you really carry the torch for uh for what this means for students and what this means for teachers. Thanks, Jeff and Lauren. I've had the pleasure of, uh, uh, of seeing your work in action in Newark. How are you? And uh, give us a little bit of background on your uh, about you, about the work that you do, and why arts education is important to you. Yeah, um, I am the beneficiary of a high quality free public arts education. Um, I received violin in the third grade, and it really changed my trajectory. I got to travel the world, um, truthfully, because of that violin. Um, I went on to study art history. Um, I've been a classroom educator. I've run after school and summer programs. So I have a lot of that 360 view of understanding what the benefits and rewards are of high quality arts education, while also understanding what the barriers and challenges often are. Um, and so a lot of our work here at Arts Ed Newark um, sometimes lives in advocacy in the traditional ways we think of it, but it also works in, in the ways of like, how do we support and enrich the sector um, as well as coalition building um, to really make sure that, that people have the things they need um, in order to um, do this kind of work, whether that's money or training or just somebody to talk to, <laughs> quite frankly. Thank so we're you. glad to be here. Thanks for having us. Great. Um, uh, Jeff, what are some of the things that you are advocating for um, as it pertains to arts education at the um, uh, state and local levels? Yeah, so arts, edu arts education advocacy has always been a, a, a core part of our, our work here at the South Carolina Arts Alliance. Um, you know, we're, we advocate for organizations, we advocate for artists, we advocate for the creative sector, but none of those things exist without arts education. Um, so that that's really where it all begins. Um, and when, when you talk to administrators and you talk to, you know, community members, you talk to legislators, I think everyone is invested in student success. 
so our job as an organization is to demonstrate why the arts are a, a crucial piece of that puzzle. So we'll never stop uh, spreading that message. Um, we're really intentional about involving students and involving teachers. And for example, our annual state house day, um, you know, giving opportunities to share those stories. But, uh, you know, there are tons of examples um, where we have, you know, led state level efforts that are directly related to arts education um, or been part of those efforts. Um, but I think that there are even more examples of uh, of us just advocating for the arts to have a seat at the table um, when uh, leaders are trying to to tackle broader issues. So uh, that might mean building out an advocacy plan that that aligns with whatever the current educational trends are uh, in our state um, or in our nation, for that matter. So, for example, in South Carolina, teacher recruitment, and teacher retention continues to be a concern, um, and state leaders are really well aware of that. So. Um, we can continue to build our message around, you know, tackling that issue together. And we can look at arts rich schools in our state and um, and say that, hey, these teachers across all the subjects, not just uh, of the arts, they love where they work. Um, they have much higher retention. Um, you know, we can point to the arts being a critical needs area in our state uh, and encourage local leaders to adopt practices that, that help recruit and, and retain arts educators. Um, or, or another example, our, our state just re released a unified plan for education and workforce development, um, which is just a kind of a cross sector plan uh, to tackle some of the workforce issues that that um, have been going on in our state. Um, so now we're looking at how the arts can contribute to those shared goals, like helping students develop the soft skills that employers are saying um, uh, that employers are saying are lacking in the workplace. So it's not always about the money. Uh, and I think 90 Ninety percent of the time, advocacy uh, is about educating stakeholders and educating leaders, raising awareness. So when it does come time to ask for a bigger investment, that groundwork is already there. So that's um, that's a lot of the work that we do. That's great. Now I uh, ha have some follow ups um, a little bit later on that. Um, what do you? Uh, uh, we've we've spoken a lot about um, your work right now at Georgians for the Arts. In some ways. Um, uh, you're just beginning uh, this process, and we both felt that it'd just be uh, very important to to share what you're doing right now because I think that that will be helpful to a lot of um, others uh, who are you know thinking about diving into to the uh, arts education advocacy space. So would you uh, mind sharing your uh, your journey thus far? Yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you. So. Um... Historically, uh, uh, Georgians for the Arts and the previous organizations before um, have really uh, kept arts education under the overall umbrella of the advocacy work that we do. It's never really been segmented. And this year, um, following our arts, Georgia Arts Day um, event where we bring um, advocates from across the state um, to um, to do advocacy work and training, uh, there seemed to be a heightened sense of awareness around uh, the need to focus on arts education from the federal level to uh, uh, funders, uh, regional organizations. And so we decided to uh, kind of take art education as a focus um, and 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 see what it is um, that we're missing and and learn what it is that you know the needs are you know in our state. Um, what we have done so far um, is look at all of the pre-existing resources that are out there. We certainly don't want to recreate the wheel. So there are um, organizations that are doing some of this work on the local level. Um, we want to be able to reach out to those organizations and partner with them. Um, one of our key organization um, kind of partners is Georgia Council for the Arts. Uh, they are a state agency that we work alongside with and they have all of the arts education resources that you need. So they're a great resource. But we've, we've also identified a um, teaching artist and art, artist registry that they have and reached out to uh, form kind of a, a group of uh, uh, kind of a cohort uh, of, of specialists around the states we've been meeting with to get a better understanding of what it is that they're looking for us to do for them and what they need from us. And uh, the top two things that, you know, uh, kind of became evident was that 
in the state of Georgia, there needs to be a convening of just art educators. So where we have um, our annual convening of all of the mediums, right? They want to be able to connect with other arts educators and teaching artists across the state and share resources and uh, examples and be best practices of what's happening in their community. And there isn't anything like that that's happening. Um, the other thing uh, from an advocacy standpoint that we see that we could potentially provide is like a training toolkit. So we can take all of the, what we know about advocacy and speaking to your elected officials and, you know, uh, connecting with your arts councils and your art commissions and looking at legislation that is either state level legislation or federal level legislation and put that together in just an arts education bucket, that that is something that we internally could probably travel the state and 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 do trainings um, is something that we're looking at. So uh, still early in, in our process, it's been um, positive and we're really excited um, about all of the information that we're learning so far uh, in our in our journey. Thanks, Wadena. Like I said, I think that that's just helpful for um, uh, for folks to hear because I think one of the things that obviously is helpful to arts education is 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 expanding that base of arts advocates, and you um, uh, are are providing a template um, on doing that. Lauren, I wanted to talk a little bit about your work at uh, Arts at Newark. Um, you have you guys. Uh, you all have some wonderful programs there. Uh, can you explain a couple of those programs and how those programs and activities link to your arts education and advocacy? Absolutely. Um, so I think the most obvious <laughs> to talk about, um, at least to start, is our Arts Ed Ambassadors program. Um, if you go to our website, which is artsednork.org, I think Olivia dropped it backslash ambassadors. Um, you can learn more about it, but it's really a parent and caregiver training program that we started a couple of years ago. Um, we are in a very interesting position here um, in New Jersey where arts education is actually constitutionally mandated. It's part of the seven required subject areas um, that all students must have access to throughout the entirety of their education here in the state. So a lot of our work is really just informing people and sharing that information with people and helping them understand what that means and addressing some of the gaps between that mandate um, as well as administrative code where it's a little bit more gray and maybe administrators don't recognize um, the importance of that. And so we spend a lot of time building community. You know, we offer dinner, we have childcare available, parents get stipends to really make sure that all the barriers are eliminated in order for them to participate. Um, and really work hard to elevate, you know, what are your rights in terms of an education in our state, um, what your children are entitled to, um, and then talk about how can we create more opportunities for young people to access the arts. And so this year, our parents put together um, a policy brief, which is not yet on the website, but will be soon, um, where they really looked at that, like the way in which, you know, there's an unfunded mandate funding um, in our state in terms of the arts, there's no QSAC, there's no sort of evaluation to connect that to, right? So how do we advocate for the investment in arts education, especially at this moment in time where everything's really heavily focused on learning loss? Um, how do we elevate some of the things that Susan was talking about earlier? And that sort of brings me to the second piece. Um, so we have that group of parents, they're activated, they're informed, they're organizing, they're building an advocacy plan on their own around that policy brief. Um, but then, you know, those are the people that sign up, they raise their hand, they, they feel the arts are important and they want to talk about arts education, they want to make sure they're invested in that, right? But then there's folks that maybe don't still recognize it, maybe they've had a positive experience with the arts, but they're still not valuing it or elevating it in the way we were talking about earlier in Susan's work. And another interesting way that we've been able to advocate is through our healing-centered engagement and the arts work. Um, so we've been doing that work for a bit longer, for about seven or eight years now, and we really look at the intersection between what the arts provide, sort of the tools of the teaching artist and the arts educator, to provide more um, healing-centered spaces for young people. And um, we started this work, ironically, before the pandemic, um, 
our mayor, Ras Baraka, um, has declared Newark to be a trauma-informed city and healing-centered city. So we saw this as our responsibility to our piece of the pie, right? We're not making art therapists. We're not asking people to replace clinicians. But what are our responsibilities? What are our opportunities in the arts to make sure that students have a really positive um, experience in school and after school programs um, through the arts and sort of using that as another way to bring people to the arts and to bring arts into spaces where they haven't been before. And so that's given us a lot of access to parents, to educators, to clinicians, to Sunday school teachers, <laughs> to tutors, to folks that interact with, we say any adult, any youth facing adult um, has participated in that program. And so it's been another way to build, again, a different coalition who's looking at the work perhaps in a different lens if they're not already sort of on the arts education bandwagon. So I think there's lots of ways that in the programs we run, um, we're building these coalitions, we're sharing information, we're educating the public um, and finding new ways to bring arts education to the, to the fold, to the front. Thanks, Lauren. Um, yeah, you you all just do such fantastic work there. And like I said, I had the pleasure of uh, seeing you all in action. Uh, Jeff, I wanted to come back to you. Um, one question that uh, we often get is, it, it, it can feel a little complicated as to who they're supposed to advocate to, who are the decision makers that they need to be reaching out to to make a difference. Can you pro provide any insight on that yeah i mean it, it that is a that is a piece of the puzzle you know identifying who the decision makers are so for example if if you're advocating for a bigger budget for your band program right that's something i've had to do right going to a state leader is probably not going to have that much impact but if i'm trying to communicate the value of you know public investment in the arts then that's a larger statewide message that that i want legislators to hear so um, you know, our, our organization tries to fill in some of the gaps on that. Um, for example, Americans for the Arts has been doing a lot of work at the national level um, to advocate for increases to the Every Student Succeeds Act um, because parts of that funding can be used for arts education. But when we talk to our le uh, local arts education leaders, we, we realize that um, a lot of district level decision makers didn't necessarily understand how the arts fit into that landscape and into that framework. So then we started to develop resources um, for teachers and for administrators um, that, that kind of broke down how the arts fit into that. Um, so that way they can take those to the local leaders. Um, and, and that kind of bridges the gap between, you know, that federal advocacy work and then also, you know, what that means for uh, for the local level. So um, I think there's a lot of work to be to be done there. Um, and, uh, and advocacy looks different depending on who you're advocating to, but, but knowing who those decision makers are is definitely the first step. Thanks, Jeff. Um, uh, moving on to you, Aduda, I wanted to ask, uh, you know, we, we have some folks in the audience who, um, you know, uh, might be an organization, um, that does not advocate for arts education, but wants to, and then we also have, um, just some independent, you know, arts advocates who uh, who heard about an Arts and Education Week webinar. Uh, what are some of the things that um, you have done uh, and can recommend for them to do to get plugged into arts education advocacy? Yeah, absolutely. And um, <laughs> uh, I mean, First and foremost, in Georgia, you know, we obviously we encourage you to, you know, join our membership. And by joining our membership, um, you will get, you know, access to, you know, uh, pertinent information and resources um, as it comes to us. But you mentioned something, uh, Tushar, that I think is really important, um, that there are folks that maybe are not arts advocates or they're not an organization and you know I think it's so important um, especially as I have been doing this work and continue to do the work that people understand that you don't have to be with an organization a group or an entity to advocate you do not have to work in the arts to advocate for arts issues that you can do that just as a as an individual and you know, encourage your family members and encourage your neighbors and 
whom whomever lives in your community, it goes to your church or wherever you 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 find them to to be able to champion um the causes that affects their lives, your lives, and you know, whomever, um, to be the change that you want to see in your community. So um um it's also really as easy as picking up the phone and um finding out who your your legislators are they're really easily accessible they're an email away they're a phone call away they really are um and if you don't get them you get their staffers their staffers are probably the best line of entry and access into anything that you need to know about the issues that your uh legislators uh support and um to be able to get them, you know, kind of get yourself on their radar, um, invite them to, you know, events that are happening in your communities uh, is a great way to really connect with them. And, you know, just know that we're, you know, we're here as a resource. Um, yeah, is 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 really, uh, really, it's really, it's sound, it's so simple yet it's so. Um, intimidating to a lot of people and it really is not an intimidating process so uh yeah well, those uh sound like words of wisdom Haduna. i'm gonna end uh last question uh both for jeff and lauren can you just talk a little bit about the importance of a coalition building uh in arts education advocacy and your experiences um, for us, I mean, we're place-based, so I know that Jeff and Waduda are working with statewide organizations. We're the city of Newark, so we're very specific and locally sort of situated. We are the largest city in New Jersey, um, but having our partners at Arts Ed New Jersey, um, having our partners at the State Department of Education, right, our local Board of Education, our local city council, um, we are a collective impact initiative, so by just design, it was really important to us that we had all the players at the table, but also that we had parent voice, that we had an educator voice, that we had student voice. Um, and so what comes with that is when a problem does arise, when there's an issue at the district level, at the state level, um, it's really easy to get people organized, or it's a lot easier to get people organized, right? Because we're all, we already know each other, we already have this community, we already have this shared knowledge, and so um, it sort of allows us to activate in a different way. And so I think building coalitions um, has really been the thing for us in terms of being heard, um, but also that alignment, right? So we have partners in the healthcare space, we have partners in the criminal justice space here in the state and the city, um, and they line up and work with us as well on certain issues where um, it's not just an arts education issue, it's a child welfare issue, or it's an education issue broadly. And so I think for us, that coalition building has strengthened our ability not only to do our work in arts education, but to get just lots of things done in the local Newark community, because we're talking to each other, we're not all in these silos. Um, and so coalitions can be a really powerful way to organize people and get alignment around any issue. Oh, great. Thank you, Lauren. How about you, Jeff? Your thoughts? Yeah, well, I mean, I think arts and collaboration go hand in hand. Um, you can't have one without the other. And we certainly can't do what we do without partnerships. Um, and, and we know that we're a statewide organization and the people with the most important stories are the other people that are closest to the issues. Um, and, and in South Carolina, especially, we've got a, a long history of this idea of collective impact um, going back, you know, over 35 years um, with the the creation of our Arts and Basic Curriculum Institute, um, which is a partnership between the Department of Education, South Carolina Arts Commission, um, and Withrop University. It's this network of arts-rich schools, professional learning for educators, for administrators and leaders, research and resources. Um, and they really led the way in demonstrating how um, the arts and creativity can can transform lives. So, so that idea um, is is really something that we tap into. Um, and, and I think that the, you know, the more recent result of that is that when all the um, American Rescue Plan money came down um, to our Department of Education, they sent the money out to the school districts, the state got to keep a little bit um, for statewide programs. And, uh, and 
through that collective impact model, the Arts Commission was able to secure 20 million over three years um, to, to tackle COVID learning loss through through um, through arts education. And that brought people like the ABC Institute, nonprofits that were already doing the work, you know, um, uh, organizations that were in after school programs, organizations that were there during the school day, teachers, administrators, and this this idea that that the work is already being done. What happens if we have an influx of, of public support for it? And man, I could talk all day about the the results of that, um, you know, and that's that's work that will continue in South Carolina. Uh, but that goes back to what I said before, that, that you have to lay the groundwork um, you know, because one day that opportunity may be there and we were in a really, um, uh, you know, a, a, a particular set of circumstances where the superintendent of education was a former music teacher, right? And we had large bipartisan support for the arts and arts education. And all of these things just happened at the same time uh, on top of a, a worldwide pandemic. Um, but, you know, we were in position to to really elevate um, the arts as, as part of that solution. So um, advocacy is a long journey. It's not always about what you can get this year or what you can get in this moment, um, but that doesn't mean that the work is not important because eventually um, you'll see you'll see that result. Thank you. Jeff. What a wonderful way to uh, uh, to end the panel. Thank you, panelists, for your wisdom and service uh, to advocate for arts education. I worked with all of you, and I'm not overstating it when I say uh, you're true game changers uh, in the arts advocacy space. Thank you so much for your time. And I'm going to turn it over to Olivia Tarpley, our dynamic public policy manager at Americans for the Arts. Hi, Olivia. Hi, Tushar, and thank you again to our wonderful panelists. Um, you all have really um, set the stage beautifully for our advocacy uh, tips and principles that we want to share with you all today. Um, a lot of what I'm about to talk about, our panelists actually have just touched on. So this is um, hopefully going to be great reinforcement for you all to be um, taking, taking these things out into your communities to celebrate National Arts and Education Week, but also to pair that celebration with advocacy. So what is advocacy and why does it matter? Advocacy is really just about telling your story, educating others, like our panelists just talked about, establishing relationships, and being authentic. You all are all the experts in your respective fields. So if you're not taking the time to educate and inform elected officials, who will? Often, if elected officials aren't hearing from folks, they're going to assume one of two things, either that everything is fine or that no one cares about a particular issue. And this is why advocacy is so important. It's so important for you to raise your voice so that you can see success and you can see things change for the better in your communities. As far as relationships, these relationships with elected officials can range anywhere from keeping in touch with their staffers regularly through email to make sure that you have up-to-date information, or you can even become an advisor or resource for an elected official. It's important that arts education advocates are taking initiative to advocate for what's best for students and teachers and for the whole ecosystem so that lawmakers can understand what laws and policies are gonna support students' learning. And remember, it's all about being authentic and sharing what's important to you and then illustrating why others should also care about that issue. Next slide, please. So some of the key principles of advocacy are that it's not a linear process. Again, like our panelists just said, this takes a lot of time. And so keep start to put advocacy as part of your daily work so that um, you can see the success down the line. Politics are fluid and change is constant and those successes don't happen overnight. So just be ready for it. Coalitions help to strengthen your work. So think about the organizations and individuals and other entities that you can work with to advance your goals. And elected officials respond to voters. So include as many people as you can so that you can see your advocacy efforts pay off. It's important to get to know your elected officials and create partnerships with them so that you can uh, be laying the groundwork for the different asks that you might have over time. 
if you wait until you really need something or something's gone awry, then it's too late. So build those relationships and partnerships early on. As you're thinking about your advocacy, create a clear message. So consider who's delivering the message, how is the message being delivered, and share the message in multiple ways so that you can strategize and make sure that the whole coalition is aligned and that the message is heard. And always make sure that the ask is clear. And then last but not least, remember it's about policy and not personality. So you may not agree with your member of Congress or their staff or other policymakers, and that's okay. When you're advocating, however, just focus on the policies and leave personality out of the conversation. Next slide, please. So now let's talk some about the different resources we have available to you all to make your case as you're advocating. Americans for the Arts and the Arts Action Fund have a lot of things that you all can use this National Arts and Education Week while you're talking to elected officials and other decision makers. So first, you can acquaint yourself with the specific funding issues using our Arts Education Funding Brief. We also have a set of fast facts that you can use to share quick bits of knowledge about how impactful arts education can be for students. The Arts Action Fund creates fact sheets that detail why the arts matter in every state. So you can use this resource to outline many of the ways that the arts are making an impact in your state. As I'm sure everyone here knows, the arts are absolutely fundamental to our humanity and they inspire us and foster creativity. They also strengthen our communities socially, educationally, and economically. So to this end, we have a set of 10 reasons to support the arts that you all can share with elected officials and decision makers to illustrate the ways that the arts touch every part of our lives. This also includes a webinar resource from our Vice President of Research, Randy Cohen, along with a written resource that you all can share with your networks and elected officials. These 10 reasons really illustrate why an investment in artists, creative workers, and arts organizations is vital to our nation's post-pandemic recovery and all the way from the economy to the classroom to our communities. We have also just released a new survey called Americans Speak Out About the Arts in 2023. This is the third in a series of national public opinion surveys about arts and culture, with the previous iterations being conducted in 2015 and 2018. The survey was conduct conducted by Ipsos Public Affairs on behalf of Americans for the Arts. And the survey reports that Americans show unequivocal and overwhelming support for arts education at all levels, including both in school, grades pre-K through 12, and out of school in the community. And last but not least, in the coming days, you can check out our social media campaign toolkit, which will provide assets that you can share, that you can use to share the news about National Arts and Education Week and also encourage your networks to participate in celebrating the week and advocating for arts education. Next slide. So in addition to celebrating National Arts and Education Week, we want you all to take action to let local, state, and federal officials know about the importance of arts education. We've developed these suggested advocacy actions for you to pair with National Arts and Education Week this year. And these action items touch on all levels of government, so from local to state to federal. The first action item is sharing the National Arts and Education Week resolution with your state and local leaders. Second, Sign the voter voice campaign to reach out to your members of Congress at the federal level to ask them to support federal arts education funding. Third, you all can join the Arts Action Fund to keep up with important news related to the arts and arts education. And then let, next, uh, check your emails for updates from Americans for the Arts about any other actions we uh, suggest that you take during National Arts and Education Week. Next slide, please. 
So if you're wondering where to um, to locate information about your elected officials, uh, USA.gov has two sites that we recommend that you all can use to figure out who you need to be in, in touch with. So this first page has state and local governments. And next slide, please. And one more slide. Thank you. And so this is another resource that you all can use to uh, get a curated list of the state and local officials that you would need to be in touch with to share the resolution. Next slide, please. This is our voter voice campaign, which you all can use to reach out to your members of Congress at the federal level to encourage them to support arts education funding. So this gives you a brief background on the arts education funding issues and has the messaging component so you can write to your elected officials and share the, share the news with them. Um, this will go to your senators and to your US um, House of Representatives member. Next slide, please. And this is where you'll find information on joining the Arts Action Fund. The Arts Action Fund shares timely legislative updates and other important news on arts and arts education issues. And again, we encourage you to be checking your email in the coming weeks as we'll be in touch with you regarding various updates related to National Arts and Education Week. Those updates will come from our email advocacy at artsusa.org. Next slide, please. Thank you. And so with that, thank you all so much uh, for attending today. Like some of our speakers have said, we really appreciate you all so much and your advocacy and your voice is very important. So we are more than happy to answer any questions that you all have. Again, as a reminder, this webinar has been recorded and you'll be able to find the recording slides and the other resources that I've just talked about on our webpage. Thank you, Olivia. Um, just wanted to quickly ask with a couple of minutes that uh, we have remaining, uh, can you just reiterate the uh, uh, the fact that you said earlier, this is kind of, uh, you know, this is only the beginning and that we're ramping up um, uh, for Arts and Education Week. What's the best way again for people to be plugged in? Yes, absolutely. So like Tushar said, this webinar has been a ramp up. National Arts and Education Week is September 9th through the 13th. And we will be in touch with you all through our email advocacy at artsusa.org. And we'll be sure to put that in the chat as well. Great, thank you so much, uh, Olivia. Um, again, uh, we will definitely be in touch with you uh, on updates on, on new assets, new materials. Um, also, please feel free to use the uh, advocacy uh, at artsusa.org. Uh, that is not a dummy account. Olivia or I will be the ones responding to you. We want to hear how um, we can uh, be a resource for you, how we can um, uh, you know, help improve your work. Um, and then really how we can learn from you because you all are the uh, state and local advocacy experts doing this work. We want to hear, um, you know, we want to learn about the great work uh, that you're doing because I think that that, that helps inform us as well. Uh, thank you all again for attending. You are wonderful, amazing partners uh, and look forward to working with you over the course of the next month. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye.